for such a good introduction, what more do I have to say, I wonder? Uh, maybe I'll just show some films. Um, so, as Anna said, I'm a, I'm a designer um, and a researcher working somewhere between Berg, the small design studio in London, and the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. And we do lots of work together. We do lots of research and design. We make products. Um, we also make lots of films. We make lots of um, uh, uh, things that go out into the world and, and uh, change... Uh, uh, try to affect change over our technological landscapes. And I think uh, the, the kind of the, the foundation for all of this work comes from very kind of humble beginnings, just uh, a bunch of designers in a room trying to work with new and emerging technologies and just realizing that they're quite invisible and quite obscure and quite difficult to work with. So from those sort of quite pragmatic, craft-based beginnings, uh, we've started to develop a, an approach and a whole set of, um, of uh, methods that we can use to start revealing and understanding the technologi technological infrastructures and systems and interfaces that we use every day in our design work. Um, so in terms of like revealing reality, the title of this session, um, it's really about... Uh, the kind of three approaches that we use to reveal the reality of technologies that we have to work with. And those three approaches can be summed up um, as culture, material, and communication, um, three things that we pay a lot of attention to. And so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do in this talk is sort of run through those three areas and talk a little bit about each one and show some of our work that kind of illustrates why we think these things are important uh, and you know, show the kind of things that we've actually managed to find um, I think these three approaches are really, really quite important. I think there's this problem that we, um, we don't really see technology and culture as connected. We see technology as a certain thing, and we see culture as something else. And the reality is that culture and technology are intricately intertwined. Uh, and I think it's really important to pay attention to that. Um, secondly, there's a problem of material. Um, as designers, we work with materials. Um, but... Recently, the idea of material has kind of disappeared, and there's many reasons for that, but I think we need to return to the idea of material in order to deal with technology. Um, and thirdly, communication. Um, we think it's really important to work communicatively, to kind of take understandings about technology, understandings about infrastructure, and to turn them into something that communicates, that shares, that, that allows these things to become objects that people can use in their own work, uh, allows them to be debated, discussed, critiqued. Um, so communication is like quite, is, alongside these other things, is really central to our work. Um, and our work is kind of dealing with the problem of invisibility and seamlessness. So I'll start off with the, the issue of kind of culture. This is um, a brilliant researcher and uh, author called Anne Balsamo. She teaches, at, uh, she's currently the dean of the New School in New York. Um, she has this concept of technoculture, which is not a very nice concept. It sounds a bit weird, but technoculture is actually really useful in that it just combines technology and culture. Um, so she says that uh, you know, technoculture is how the meaning of new technologies are reproduced, structured, manipulated, hijacked, and sometimes contested. And she wrote a book called Designing Culture, which is all about how these things actually come together in design processes, how designers rely on existing meanings in cultural context for, for all of their design work. It's not just about the opportunities and constraints of technology. It's about how you kind of use existing meanings to, and symbols and signs and all these things to actually make technology make sense. Um, so she's really an advocate of this idea that culture and technology are absolutely intricately intertwined and cannot be separated. Um, so in terms of you know, what we're thinking about in terms of technology, we think it's really interesting and useful to study um, our kind of technocultural landscape. And I kind of like picking on, on Microsoft, um, not because this is, you know, this is a very compelling vision of the future, but um, it's a kind of piece of design fiction that I find quite, quite uh, difficult. It doesn't exist in any cultural or material reality that I recognize. Uh, it doesn't, I'm not even sure if it exists in commercial and in commercial reality that I recognise. Um, so these sort of visions of technology in the future and interaction are incredibly persuasive and pervasive. Um, they become the way that people think about technology. Um, they become these kind of dominant visions of a kind of seamless, 
invisible landscape where all technology, technology is invisibly and seamlessly embedded in the environment. Uh, and we've got rather strange interfaces that kind of are gestural and haptic and, and touch-based. These kind of visions really celebrate the invisibility and seamlessness of technology. Uh, and it, it, they become very difficult to critique and unpack because they're so seamless. They're, sort of this, they're so smooth. There's nothing to get hold of. Um, Honor mentioned uh, Julian Oliver. Julian Oliver has this fantastic idea that we live in a children's book reality of technology, that we rely on this kind of the idea of the cloud, the matrix, a series of tubes to describe the internet. Um, and this is all really kind of you know, childish kind of mythology and, and metaphors. Um, and he says that if you cannot unpack or describe the en engineered parts of the environment, you cannot critically engage with the world, with the world in which you live. Uh, when you can't describe the world, you can't, you, when you can't see your world, you can't describe it. I think this is a, it's a particular problem for technology now that it's become so invisible and so seamless. So one of the ways that I've been approaching this is to just pay close attention to the world around us, the world of technology. This is a film, that I'm, it's not finished yet, it's a kind of ongoing study of people using phones. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by the fact that everyday life has been so radically transformed by smartphones and iPhones and Androids and whatever. Um, and yet, they're kind of invisible and normalized. It's, sort of, it's this incredible kind of shift that we've had with these incredible infrastructures that support these small slabs of plastic, aluminum, and glass. Um, and yet, it's almost gone unnoticed. Um, so it's really interesting to just sort of flag up, just, 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 to, use, just to study the kind of contemporary culture in which technology you know, is, is, uh, is emerging. Um, and to sort of use that as a way of reflecting about how actually the infrastructures and the technologies behind them have disappeared. Um, so, you know, all we're seeing is these kind of the, the sort of the end points of this enormous network and how that kind of interaction comes into the world. And also how so much interaction has disappeared into the screen. So behind kind of piece, you know, behind glass, we're sort of interacting with pictures through glass. So this is a kind of this film is a sort of a, a way of saying, okay, let's, we, should, we should sort of make sure that we pay attention, pay close attention, as James Bridle says, to the kind of the things that are going on in the world in our contemporary techniculture. Um, I did a long project um, a few years ago that studied RFID, radio frequency identification. It's the kind of technology that you find in your Oyster card in London or in library cards or, or entry cards. Um, and it's a really a fascinating technology. It's... It's incredibly ubiquitous. I think there was something like 30 billion RFID chips sold in 2012 alone. So there's more RFID chips in the world than there are humans. Um, it's kind of emerged in, in, in sort of many different ways. We use it you know, on London transport. We use it all across the world. Um, it's got this kind of dominant vision, this kind of idea of the internet of things that perhaps the physical world might reflect the internet. We might have this, a massive kind of um, change in the way we use physical objects that reflects how the kind of change we've had in the internet. Um, it's very much about efficiency, security. Um, it's seen as a kind of enabler, as uh, enabler of frictionless capitalism. We can kind of swipe and pay for things without even worrying about it. We don't even have to think to make transactions anymore. Um, so it's got lots of kind of visions embedded in this technology. Um, but it's also very controversial. People don't like RFID. RFID embedded in people or embedded in animals. Uh, the idea that you might have chips embedded in your, in your clothes or your products. People are kind of scared of this stuff. Um, and for, for very good reasons. And, uh, you know, it, it comes down to the fact that it's invisible. It's invisibly implanted, embedded in stuff. And it also relies on radio waves that we can't see. So we don't know, I don't know if I'm currently being tracked or not. Um, so RFID has, these, has this invisibility which kind of enables these, these incredible visions of how technology might change the world. But it also, the invisibility also causes these kind of strange uh, fear and mythology, which you know, is, is also a very, very large part of the technology. Pragmatically, it's also a very playful, robust, and interesting technology to use as an interface. This is a set of Brio toys that you use RFID to kind of make children's toys about how the internet works. Um, so in, in some ways, it's actually a very interesting t uh, interface technology as well. It's actually, it has lots of reasons why it has become so pervasive. So that's a kind of 
introduction to the idea of like studying the kind of cultures and the, the ways in which technology, the meaning around technology is, is, is perceived and the way in which these technologies have emerged through these kind of contested meanings. Um, why should we think about these things as design materials? I, mean, I, I talk about it as from a design perspective. I'm a designer. Um, I think there's a, there's a bit of a crisis across many domains, but particularly in, in design, that we've lost the idea of materials. Um, materials have become invisible, they've become seamless. Um, we need to think about materials a little bit. Um, there's a brilliant researcher uh, called Donald Shen who said a while ago that designers have a reflective conversation with materials. Um, that when we, when it, we as designers or people who are making stuff, we, we make physical objects and the physical objects talk back to us. So as we're shaping them, the material talks back to us in conversation. And it's a really nice, uh, really nice formulation, a really nice idea that materials have a kind of agency in the world and that we, you know, as designers, we don't just impose our will on wood. Wood has grain, it has all sorts of things that, you know, that talk back to us. So materials are really, have been really, really critical in the kind of craft tradition of design. Um, another great thinker, Ezio Manzini, uh, wrote a fantastic book called The Materials of Invention. And he says that design is the intersection between what is thinkable and what is possible. In other words, um, it's between culture and material. It's like the material is, is the constraint for what is thinkable. So again, like this idea that design is kind of constrained by its materials. Um, I think that's, you know, it, it's really interesting and important to recognize that design has this great history of working with material that's kind of now become very, very muddied. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, design has kind of user Stockholm syndrome. Um, this is Bruce Sterling's brilliant term for the kind of user-centered participatory design uh, traditions, which very much like focus on the user and at the expense of you know, dealing with materials that we use to make things. Um, there's so much study of users that we sort of, you know, it's, it naturally has gone at the expense of dealing with materials. Um, our materials are complex. We have a really, really complex data, infrastructures, systems, interfaces that we have to deal with. Um, they change really fast. So, you know, as, as designers or makers will know, you know, every year there's some new way of making a technological object. Uh, it's not like they're stable at all. And they, they get obsolete very, very quickly. Um, they're also deliberately hidden and invisible. So like the Microsoft vision of the future, it's really about in hiding the technological stuff underneath. So it's very difficult to interrogate that stuff and, and to know how it actually works. So we don't really see the kind of material reality, but uh, the material reality underneath these things. Um, and there's also this myth of immateriality, the idea that actually the digital is immaterial. Um, and it's a really pervasive myth, and it's probably wrong. Um, this is Ben who is a digital archivist, uh, complaining about the idea that people think that the digital is immaterial, because actually it's not. Um, this is another brilliant researcher called um, Jean-Francois Blanchet, who says that computing systems are suffused through and through with the constraints of their materiality. He basically says that you know, um, microprocessors get hot, uh, networks have latency, they have physical wires, hard disks have magnetic platters and heads and movement, and they're actually moving. There's all these material qualities that are in computing that have an extraordinarily important effect on how computing actually develops. Um, it's really important to, to recognize those things. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, computing is not just behind a screen anymore. Digital, the digital is not just underneath glass. It's actually in the world around us. So it has physical and spatial properties. We have to, you know, interact with it gesturally within, with space. So there are material qualities to the technology, not just in the, in the digital, but also in its physical presence. And, you know, that's something that we have to get back to using techniques of material exploration, something that Tom Armitage has talked a lot about at Berg, um, the, the idea that we need to explore our materials in order to design. And, you know, we do a lot of this kind of stuff, as I'm sure a lot of you do as well, of sort of uh, unpacking and revealing components and making sure that we understand how technologies actually work as, as a process of material exploration to, to increase our understanding of how these things actually work. Um, so that's a sort of strategy and a tactic to kind of use uh, use material exploration as a way of flagging up the idea that materials are really important in interaction design. Um, so I wanted to sort of 
talk next about the idea of communication and the kind of um, the third of the, the, the ideas or the, the, the approaches that we use. We always at Berg and, and in, in Aho, in Oslo, always talk about the Eameses as a kind of uh, a wonderful example of how designers have used film as or communic communicative practices as ways of talking about emerging technology. This is the Eames is talking, uh, you know, in a, in a commercial information film for uh, Polaroid, the, Polar the launch of the Polaroid SX-70. And in this film, they, you know, they, they deconstruct the idea of optics, of chemical processes. Um, they even go into the kind of microprocessors and stuff underneath it. But all of this is kind of, all of this explanation of technology is all contextualized by beautiful imagery. It's absolutely brilliantly produced. I don't know actually how in 1972 they were doing such beautiful animation that combined live action and, and graphics. It's, it's absolutely stunningly beautiful in, in its kind of, in its communicative realization. So this is really inspirational stuff for, for designers who want to talk about you know, the world in which we live and the, and the technologies that we use. You know, they're talking about microprocessors here. Really, you know, really going into how this camera actually works. Um, another researcher, um, David Kirby, he wrote a brilliant book called Lab Coats in Hollywood. Um, he is looking at ways to um, ways to find out how science and cinema are connected. The development of technologies. He, he sort of his conclusion is that the development of technology is intricately linked to the ways that it's depicted in cinema. Which you know we wouldn't have had moon landings without you know Destination Moon as a as a film. So it, it's it's a really interesting analysis of how how communicative things and technology go hand in hand. And he says that films visually visually and emotionally immersive environment enables it to dominate our techno scientific imagery, imaginary sorry. So the, 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 the way in which we imagine technology, the way, the way in which we think about it, is very much defined by cinema. Um, I want to take a very brief diversion and talk about something that I absolutely love, which is the technique of light painting. And it's relevant because we use it a lot. Um, light painting is the, is the technique where you open, you set up a camera on a tripod, open up the lens, attach a light to something, and just keep the shutter open. And as the person moves through, or as, as something happens in front of the frame, you get these beautiful light paintings. It's an old, really old technique, going back to 1914. Uh, this is John Milley, who used it for Life magazine to document dancers. This is Andreas Feininger, son of Lionel Feininger of Bauhaus fame, um, using it to, you know, to, just to photograph you know, the technology of the time in the 1940s. Um, this is a helicopter taking off. This is actually the people who invented light painting, Frank and Lillian Gilbreth. They were kind of time and motion studies people in the, 19, in the early uh, 20th century. Um, and they used it to study um, workers' movements. So he, this is a, a production line study using light painting. They attached light bulbs to people's hands and studied the motion that they used to, um, to, to construct things. I think this is a bricklayer or a stacking boxes. Um, they did lots of really nice things, like using flashing lights, so you could actually see the speed of people's hands moving. Really, really beautiful work. And it was kind of like the kind of time and motion studies were the kind of beginning of the industrial era, and they were using these kind of visual techniques to convince factory workers that they should change their, their production methods. Um, they created wire models out of these things, so they could say, well, this is the kind of movement we had before, this is what we have next. So really trying to explain an immaterial phenomena through this technique of light painting. And of course, light painting is a, is a beautiful photographic technique. This is Emptying the Fridge by Mike Mandel, who's kind of taking on the, Gil the Gilbreth technique. Um, and this is work that uh, takes something else which is really interesting. It takes the Roomba and uh, light paints the Roomba's hoovering of the of a living room. And this is really interesting for me because this is revealing the kind of the, the invisible side of algorithms. This is revealing the, the stuff that we can't necessarily read um, using light painting. So it's, it's, un, it's unpacking the behavior of a digital object that's incredibly complex using this process of light painting. And I think this is a Samsung Hoover using the same method. So it has a very different, very different pattern. That's a Roomba Samsung. So very different kind of algorithms going on, on, on underneath. So you can start to interrogate these highly complex and closed off technical systems by using this technique called light painting. 
another beautiful image. I just love these, love these images just for their aesthetic qualities. They're amazing. Um, but also for what they reveal. I think it's brilliant. Um, so back to RFID. As I said, we've been studying RFID for a long time. And it's an invisible technology. This, is a, this black square here is an RFID reader. Um, it's the kind of component that you would get in underneath the yellow bit of an Oyster card, uh, Oyster card reader. What we've done is to take the technique of light painting and apply it to RFID. So here is an RFID um, being read. And every time it reads, it reads, a light flashes. And we do this in a dark room, have a camera locked off in that dark room. And we, what we can do is we can end up painting the field around an RFID reader using this technique. Um, and for, for me, this is a kind of way of revealing the spatial materiality of RFID. It's the kind of stuff that, um, it, it has lots of, lots of reasons for doing it, but as designers, we were really frustrated working with these black squares, because they're, they're just black boxes. Um, they're very, very difficult to interrogate. Finding a kind of means to reveal how it inhabited the world is really, really important for us to know how we could actually use it in our designs. How should we design with it? But I think it also addresses wider concerns that you know, RFID is often seen as a technology that you get embedded under your skin and all of a sudden you appear, you appear as a red dot on a map tracked by satellites. And many people have shown that the, kind of the, the Casino Royale and, and Prison Break have like, really affected our opinion of these technologies because you know, that's really persuasive kind of visions of the technology. But in fact, if the field only goes so far, is it really possible to track us with satellites? Wouldn't it be better to have, instead of having these strange mythologies that are kind of about technologies being read, RFID being read by satellites, wouldn't it be better to have a proper debate about the technology as it kind of actually stands, as the kind of around its material reality? It doesn't mean it's not problematic, but you know, I think we should be, be able to talk about the technology from a kind of material understanding of it. This is another mapping we did of the Oyster card. So we took a RFID reader and poked the RFID reader for many days in a dark room uh, and, uh, and revealed the field around an, an Oyster card. And what you know, was really interesting, once you've done this, you'll start seeing these kind of green mushrooms sprouting up all over the world. Every time you sort of interface with, a, with an RFID reader, you go, oh, there's the green mushroom I want. You know. So, so it, it has kind of, it's revealed a material understanding for us in, through, through a visual means. Um, with Einar Snev Martinson and Jörn, who's here, Jörn Knudsen, at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design, we extended this technique. We wanted to look at the, um, look at the space of Wi-Fi networks. We think that Wi-Fi, obviously Wi-Fi is, is an enormously important infrastructure uh, as part of our cities and our homes, um, but we didn't know how, RFI, how Wi-Fi inhabited our spaces. So what we did was to cr create this four meter long wooden pole with lights along the edge, and when we took that pole around Oslo, um, we could, uh, and took long exposure pictures of them by walking around, we could sort of reveal the space of Wi-Fi networks. So the, the taller the graph, the stronger the Wi-Fi signal. Um, so it's taking the same light painting technique and just applying it to a different technology. Uh, we made a film about that. I'll show, it, I'll show a bit of that to you now. If you're interested in these images, go and have a look at the Immaterials exhibition in Lighthouse just around the corner. Um, all of, many of the images and the film is on show there, and it's very nice to see some of these images at large scale and be able to study them. Um, almost finally, um, our latest project is looking at GPS 
GPS is even more significant to our daily interaction. You know, the idea of locating ourselves, the idea that our smartphones know where we are, it's really, really critical, not just to mapping, but all sorts of services are starting to rely on GPS. You know, things are starting to rely on GPS for timing. So one of the things that we've done is to, uh, to create a, a new project called Satellite Lamps. Um, these are, this is a satellite lamp in the center of the, of the image. Um, it glows brighter when the accuracy of GPS signals increases. Um, by going out into the world, um, setting these lamps up, and taking time-lapse time sequences of these, uh, these uh, probes, we're able to kind of see how GPS signals change over time. And we learned that GPS signals are actually really unstable. Uh, they change, you know, satellites move across the, across the Earth in about 17 minutes, something like 17 minutes. So the, ch the signals are changing all the time. We really wanted to start to understand how GPS signals would change in different spaces. And they're also inc obviously incredibly affected by their physical the urban infrastructure around them. Um, so this is a, a, so a beginning to, uh, of a film which will be launched later this year, but it's actually on display at Lighthouse um, that starts to show how, how GPS inhabits space. Um, and you can see that you know, the, the lamps, when they're together, they start to show the differences in GPS signals around the, around the urban environment. Just in summary, I think there's a real, real importance to sort of to focus our attention, to pay really close attention to the culture of technology, the, the things that are going on in daily culture. And I think it's too often overlooked. And it means that we don't have the language, we haven't developed the metaphors, we haven't developed the right kind of approaches to affecting those meanings. Um, without actually understanding how people understand technologies, we'd, we'd have a difficulty in affecting the way that people understand them. So I think it's really important to sort of study and participate in those kind of cultural constructions. Um, I think it's really important that we find a way of talking about materials again, because materials sort of, the, the idea of materials advocates for, um, for uh, the agency of the things around us, the idea that we, ha we shape them, but they also shape us. Um, and finally, I think the, the, the thing about working communicatively, that um, there's a need for not just designers to share understandings and materials, but for a broader public and for broader sets of audiences and uh, the, the ability to understand, uh, discuss, and critique. I think there's a real importance there for creating objects around which, uh, around which these discussions can happen. And I think that's been our, our intention with this work. So um, as Anna said, lots of the work is on, on display around the corner at Lighthouse. It'd be lovely if you went and saw that. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you.